architects are looking for more content, even if the project is not that amazing, they may have a client who loves whatever was created for them. And it's the emotion that you can share. Business of Architecture UK, episode 58. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, as I'm sure you know by now, because I'm very aware that many of you binge listen to the Business of Architecture UK and I fully endorse that and I think that's the best way to listen to all of these interviews. So if you're doing that and this is like the sixth episode that you're on and you're on your bicycle cycling somewhere exciting or or going on site, thank you very much for listening. It's massively appreciated. So today's episode uh, was recorded in a delightful studio in West London and I was contacted by um, by Bowerbird, um, who are originally an Australian outfit and company, and they are an app which helps architects get published into a vast, vast array of different types of architectural uh, digital publications and print uh, publications. And it just makes the process very, very straightforward and simple. So I had the, the fantastic opportunity to sit down with co-founders, uh, Nick Granlees and Ben Morgan, and also Celeste Bolt, who is the head of the UK operation. So Nick was originally an architect himself and then became an architectural photographer. And Ben has his background in design journalism. And... What was really fascinating about this conversation is a number of topics, you know, both um, Nick and Ben's entrepreneurial journey, why they set up this app, why they felt it was so important to make the uh, publishing process for architects so much easier um, is very, very interesting. But they also go into a lot of very good content and details about, you know, how to get your architecture published, the kind of mistakes that architects typically make with the media and when they're trying to get published, um, the different types of of architectural publications, the art of crafting a story that's going to land in the listening very powerfully of your target clients and your appropriate audience, how, this was fascinating as well, that the how to best use visual storytelling and how important the art of photography is in uh, promoting and marketing our buildings and our architecture. So this is a a very fantastic opportunity uh, to sit down and speak with these guys. So sit back, relax and enjoy Bowerbird. Welcome guys. Thank you so much for being on on the show. You guys have come all the way from Melbourne. Australia. Mm, yeah. yes. Just to see you. Specifically Amazing. for this podcast. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this is what I like to hear. 36 hour journey, especially for you on the business of architecture. We have, we have zero jet lag. I love it. Yeah, fantastic. Fresh when, off the plane. When, when did you, I know you guys have been here for a couple of weeks mm. or a couple of, a week or so. I've been here for three months now. Oh, three months, so you've been here for ages. Yeah, and I've been <laughs> like settled in proper, yep. you're like a Londoner now. Oh, you know it. <laughs> she started saying I'm a local. Uh, you know I, me. Uh, that happened, happened fast. <laughs> have you got an English accent yet? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> any any like little bits of slang that you've picked up? I'm really liking how people say something is well. Oh, it's something. well good. It's well good or it's well lush. And I like lush as well. Ooh, lush. Lush, yeah, that is lush. That's a good that's a good word. I I'm like enjoying it. that. Nice. <laughs> Very good. Nice. <laughs> cool. Excellent. So Bowerbirds, we've got Celeste, Ben, and Nick. Um You've come from Ben's. You've come from journalism as a background. Yeah, yeah. I studied journalism at university, and then came out and and started working straight into um, design and architecture publishing uh, in a little place in Sydney. Uh, and the rest is history. I've been working within design and architecture publishing for uh, over ten years now. Wow, amazing! And Celeste, you've got a PR background. Yeah, so I was working um, at a really large firm in Australia running their digital and social marketing, so a lot of um, project marketing. Right. So really coming from that comms side, um, you know, speaking about projects and working with the media to get those out there. Brilliant. And Nick, you you were once... Uh, once an architect. Once an architect. Always an architect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you never really um, stop becoming an architect, you just die. But, um, <laughs> um, it's, it's there, it's like in the bone marrow now. Well, it's part of your identity. I mean, it, it takes so long to become an architect. You yeah. don't really mm-hmm. just do it and then sort of leave it behind. But I was doing that and then jumped into architectural photography. And that's what led to Bowerbird and 
you know what we're doing now. So, so tell me what what is Bowerbird? How would you how would you describe what it is that you guys do? Because it's, it's it's a fascinating platform, and it's well, I guess it's a platform, so it's digital. It's all online, and the idea is that architects upload content around their projects, which journalists use in all all their stories around the world. So magazines, newspapers. Uh, websites, even Instagram accounts. Mm -hmm. And so we try to connect those two groups. And in doing that, we've ended up becoming a research team, jumping all over the world, uh, exploring different cities and trying to uncover all these projects which sit on the hard drives of architects. So how did this come about? Well, it started, I guess, a scratch your own itch sort of problem, which was when I was doing architectural photography, I wanted to figure out how to get those photos published. And so I started to talk to journalists and ask them, how does this all work? Like, you know, what are you struggling with? How do I make this work better for you as well? And then they told me a few things which were a little bit irritating for them, like the hard parts. And they basically said, look, if you can give us a package of content which is ready to go, that makes our life a lot easier. So don't come to me with a, you know, I've got a project that may, may be ready in six months come to me with all the photos, tell me all about the project, and then I can say yes or no and I can get on with writing a story. So that started off with a very basic idea of a PDF. And Ben saw that original PDF, which it's not pretty. It's just... A <laughs> <laughs> but it did the job. I, 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 yeah, I think uh, coming from the journalism side at the moment, Nick sort of told me the idea around Bowbird. Um, I, I thought it was amazing. I thought it would solve a lot of problems. I was working within uh, digital media at the time, so online. It's a really hungry beast. You really can't feed it enough content. Um, but it's really hard as a digital editor to find a lot of projects because... Generally on the whole and particularly sort of 10 years ago, uh, architects were not good at sharing that content and creating that content. Um, so, yeah, when, when Nick and I met, I suppose, six years ago and then started to click on certain things, we then um, looked at Bowbird together and I just went, this is going to go great. The journalists are going to love it. Yeah, and so the second part of it was, okay, so you have this content, but then who do you send it to? And so the big question at the time was the world of media was changing a lot and that was because of social media and the online world. And I'd been involved with social media. That's how I built my brand in photography. So I could see that things were changing and that was the future, but nobody was really talking about it. And so the project started off originally with just this idea like, oh, what if I could map out the world's media? You know, just a small task. Like, <laughs> yeah, I can just do that in a weekend. And I had been playing with things like WordPress, making your own websites. And all it really was was... a website full of information like what publications exist and who are the editors and i was just going to use that internally and then i started to show ben this idea and he was saying wow that's really cool um maybe there's something more here and that's what led to originally a prototype which was uh just this idea that architects upload their content and we know who's who so go email this person but then we spent about a year and a half redesigning the entire platform and turning it into more of a social network mm. we just spent a lot of time walking and talking trying to figure out well what should this look like and how do all the pieces go together yeah i think if we went back and looked at the code from the original version that we launched and had success with so we had subscribers um architects subscribed to the platform we had about 30 subscribers um mm. that signed up in the first couple of months um but if we went back and had a look at that that yeah. product it would probably shock us <laughs> yeah it's a um it was a way of validating the idea mm. and we very quickly realized if we keep working on the original platform it was going to explode and so that's why we went back and rebuilt the whole thing using the same technology that airbnb uses or twitter uses just making it serious rather than you know pulling together bits and pieces of tools that we could easily access we had to go down to the ground and learn how to code and f because that gives you so many more options of the features and the things that you can do with it and so it was a hard choice at the time but it allowed us now to keep growing and to continue to grow and add things so those that early subscription model that you had were you requiring sort of outside investment to kind of develop the platform or was the initial prototype of it actually working enough in order for you to kind of develop the platform organically if you like we've always been self-funded amazing so we took that approach because we there were things about the funding model which we didn't like so things like a cliff 
So you get a beekeeper cash, but you've got to make something work within 12 months. And we really believed in the idea. We just needed to, we needed the time to be able to make it work. So we didn't want to suddenly get all these architects on board and then realize 12 months later, nobody else was going to fund that next step. So we did whatever we could to figure out how to do it. And I guess the architect in me wants to make things myself. Yeah. Um, if I'd been smart, maybe there'd be way faster ways to do these things. But you go on a journey of figuring out, well, how do you code? Or how do you, how do you make a business out of this? Or how, does, how do you find projects from around the world? Each one of those steps was always a challenge. And we always just seemed to work through it and come up with a solution. Yeah, I think, you know, the startup world and, and getting funding means that you move very fast and the idea is that you fail fast um, mm. so that you find what doesn't work really quickly. Um, for us, it was it, the slow process has worked much better. We've been able to not force ourselves to do things, you know, not to chase the shiny things because we've got the ability to do it. We sit with something for a really long time before we actually, um, you know, program it. Or, or go ahead and do it. So I think that slower process has been fantastic for us, but it also means we've, we're building a sustainable business. You can't grow unless you've got income. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been great for us. Every time we sort of go to the next level, it's because we've proven what came before. Yeah, and that, that can often be a bit of a, a falsehood when there's like a surplus of investment cash of, you know, you're not actually mm -hmm. testing whether something's working because it's been funded externally. There's yeah, it's, it's growth at all costs. And they're just trying to get users on the platform yeah. and with the hope that one day they'll be able to monetize them. Mm. Um, and that's why you see these startups, they have a lot of noise and then they disappear. Mm. So we've tried to be the opposite. We've tried to be really small. And we pitch this to architects as well saying, you know, this exists because you subscribe to the platform. If you support us, we can keep doing this. Mm. If you don't support us, it will disappear. Um, and that's worked really well. That's, that's why we're so focused on community. And again, I've noticed you guys, you do a lot of one-to-one -one interactions with how you're kind of growing the platform and there's, that's a, there's a lot of relationship building inherent in the... Yeah, we, I mean, we're a tech company. So in the beginning, you know, there was a lot of focus on social media and how you might be able to market yourself and things that you can do remotely without having to have a massive team because, you know, if you don't have any budget to do anything, you're trying to minimize that. And then we kind of figured out that if we just go knock at an architect's door and have a conversation with them, that sort of cuts through, you know, six months of creating content and doing all these things and not knowing what the outcome may be. And we just go talk to somebody and then we had more content on the site. Yeah, and I think it, it was a really interesting time. Um, how we came to that was that we, we launched in North America um, and that was just sort of serendipity more than anything else. We were working with someone um, in Melbourne in our co-working space. He was working for another company in sort of tech sales, moved back to Canada after traveling the world for a bit. And we went, oh, do you want to launch uh, Bowbird for us? And we really, you know, in all honesty, we had no idea what shape that was going to take, but we thought, hey, he's got a background in sales. Um, so Nick went over and spent what, six weeks or so? Uh, I don't think it was even that long. I think I was in Vancouver for about three or four weeks and we got there and it was like, so what are we going to do? And Chris said, why don't I try and line up some meetings? And he's really good at picking up the phone and talking to people. And before we knew it, we had booked out three weeks of meetings and we were on such a high because we'd opened up this city and you could hear all the stories and the architects would refer us to somebody else. And, and suddenly we were going, oh, okay, maybe we can do this outside of Melbourne. And that's what started this whole traveling the world process. And that's how Celeste came to be here as well. Um, we, once we did Vancouver, we put a post out on Instagram just saying, travel the world with Bowerbird, not really knowing what that actually meant. <laughs> And we had 40 people sort of put their hands up saying, I want to do that in my city. And, um, and that's how Celeste has ended up being in London. Mm, yeah, I mean, I was um, already involved with Bowerbird, but I was on the other side of the table as a client. So the practice that I was working for, um, part of their comms team, we were the first enterprise client to sign on to Bowerbird. And it totally changed the way that we shared our story with the media because, you know, previous to that, we were working, there was two of us for the 500 person practice and we were working sort of, you know, day and night slogging really hard to try and get content ready for the public. But um, when we started using Bowerbird, we just had this media ready repository of content that we could just become a lot more of an efficient operation. 
Um, but eventually I thought that, you know, big practice was less for me and that I was up for a change. And so, you know, I'd already worked with Ben and Nick and knew exactly, you know, what their value set was and I knew that that aligned with me. So this opportunity came up and I just thought, why not? Brilliant. And so from your experience working in a large architectural practice and now working at Bowd, what have been the weaknesses or the pain points that architects experience in trying to get their work into publications? Mm. And what are the sort of misunderstandings about the process? I think that um, well, I, I'll start with the pain points because often um, an architect will approach their favorite publication. Now, maybe here that's someone like Dazeen. And they'll shoot across um, a couple of photos and a little description, but then they won't hear back. And I think that that, um, I guess, maybe um, lack of understanding about what the submissions process actually is creates a pain point for architects because they feel, oh, but I've sent you my work, you know, why aren't you going to publish it? But, you know, publications have this whole set of criteria that they need to fulfill really to be able to publish a story. So I think that that's one of the pain points, but also, you know, Working um, as part of a media team, for us, it was um, getting content ready for the media. So I think architects um, are so preoccupied, and so they should be, preoccupied with designing and being architects that they maybe often forget that there is all this other work that goes on around the scenes to get their story out there, particularly in large practices. You know, the media team is um, integral to their practice because they're sharing their stories about their work and the most important thing you can do as an architect is tell your story because the more that you broadcast yourself the more you start to align yourself with potential clients and even potential staff and peers that have the same values as you so you work in this sort of upward spiral and you start um, I guess winning work and more of the work that you want to do more of got it and and so how do architects often fail in communicating their stories? Oh, I think language is a big one there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a common phrase, but archi speak, um, known, known around the world. It's, mm. it's essentially It essentially grows out of um, a post-justification process. So rather than thinking about what the real story is mm. behind something, architects will often lean back on their academic writing and they'll start to fluff things out and use words like, um, you know, fenestration. It's a great word, means something, but to anyone else out there, no one knows what fenestration is. Um, glazed, and even glazed aperture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, could, we could sit here all, all day. In fact, we, we have a, um, we use Slack as a team um, and uh, we often, we have a channel on there that's just about ArchiSpeak, amazing examples where architects say a lot without actually saying anything at all. Oh, well, I need to see some examples of this. <laughs> we'll show you some off air. Yeah, <laughs> just so that we don't name and shame anybody. We, we're waiting for one. One day we'll just have an exhibition and we'll take all the names off and mm. we'll just put them up in a big room oh, for the architects to walk around and read some <laughs> of the text we find. I, th I think it's I think it's interesting. It's easy from the outside to go and point at people and say, "Oh, you've done this," but like I, I read back on some of my own writing. I'm a professional writer. Um, I look back on some of my own writing and just go, "Oh, I did the same thing." So mm. often, a lot of it is just making sure that someone else has read over something and uh, you know, just a member of the public. Does this make sense to you? Um, and you know, you can usually avoid. The archi speak just by going through that process. Yeah, and it's about having a writing structure. So if you ask somebody to describe their project, there's a million ways you could describe it. And so you get lost in trying to make it probably bigger than it actually is and missing the real story underneath it. Mm. So if you just have a very simple structure, so we keep talking about this idea of brief challenges and solution. It's a writing structure. So the brief is what did the clients want? Because you start off with your client's words and they set up this um, challenge. And then you say, well, what were the challenges in achieving that? And there's all these amazing things that architects do. Like, let's say you've, uh, you know, a small family, they're living in, in a small house. They love their street and their community, but there's not enough room. What do they do? Well, the architect has to figure out how to add an extra room or something. So that's the interesting challenge and that's the story. And then you end up with a solution, which is this was what we came up with. That is a genuine story. It has potentially the client's emotion. It has real people. And that's a great way of describing architecture. It makes it really accessible to the general public. Mm. And I think as well, when you start to tell um, the client story and the human story of a project, you start to show 
the value of architecture. So when you say, okay, well, the budget was cut halfway through this project, so we had to, you know, change the way that we laid out this renovation or this um, extension, you start to go, okay, well, you couldn't do this as a renovator, but as an architect, we could do that within a constrained budget and we still had a fantastic outcome. Look at this, you know, beautiful set of images. So you start to say, you know, architecture is more than just design. It's fixing all these problems that you're going to come up against. And that's where an architect's value is. And the more that you can communicate your value, the more that you can, you know, win better work and win work with clients that you really want to work with. And, and so how, do, how does Bowerbird support architects in, in structuring that message correctly? We do two things. So we, we have a description um, section in in a bow kit so we'll take a step back so yeah t- t- tell me tell me like if i'm an architect i've got i want to get some publication for my practice i've got a whole load of random projects yeah. nothing's really coordinated yet i know that i need to get out there something i haven't maybe i think i've got a bit of a mission statement written somewhere mm-hmm. so let's assume you've got a project that's finished and you've had it photographed and it's a good project okay you're not going to get published if it's not a good project so you've got those uh, those basics. Then what you do is you jump on a Bowerbird and you upload the content that you have. So the images, the plans, and then you answer. Um, you provide the the data or the details around that project. So we don't ask people to write amazing stories. What we're asking for is the who, what, where, why information. So the best way of doing that to get into a story uh, that we find is to use Q and A's. So if I ask an architect a question such as what were the sustainability features, I'll get a very direct answer. But if I ask describe your project, it'll go into crazy land speaking (laughs) about who knows what they were studying at university. Um, So if you get those pieces, that's what the journalists really want. Because an interesting um, aspect here is that architects tend to be visual, so they love the images. Journalists tend to be uh, word people. So when architects send them garbage words, it's kind of insulting to the journalists. It's like now they have to decipher what the real story is underneath it. Mm. Um, So that's what we try to do. We Basically, a bow kit is this online media kit full of all this content that lots of different journalists can use to craft different stories around your work. And we figured out, we basically reversed engineered the questions that journalists ask. And so the architect just goes through, puts in that information, then they can send it out to the journalist. And I suppose the other thing that we that we do is that we kind of talk about the app itself, the technology being about 10% of what we do. And the other 90% is going out and meeting with architects one-on-one. It's um, teaching people through things like our podcast, um, you know, storytelling techniques uh, and going and meeting with organizations as well. So we, mm-hmm. we partner with organizations. We're sort of an open book on that front. We'll meet with anyone and, and see how we can help them because the whole aim of Bowerbird is this, north star of ensuring that more great architecture gets commissioned by the public and everyone can sign on to that um we we really need to get more of the uh, great work out there to the public get them to understand and value architecture so that you know there's there's more for everyone we grow the pie and and is it do you specialize in working in a certain size of architecture practice or can you help anyone from a one-man band to a 500 person well, there's a funny story there, Celeste. <laughs> um, originally, obviously, I came out of small practice. So I was thinking, how do we allow small architects to tell their stories in the same way that large firms who have media teams do it? But as we started to come across larger firms, um, people like Celeste sort of would say, hey, can we use this too? And we were like, well, I guess so. And then we had to learn with those larger firms what their pain points were, Mm. which are different to small firms. It was a very collaborative approach, I think, once that I had signed on to becoming a client because, you know, as you say, a smaller practice will upload their projects, maybe an associate or a director does it, or maybe it's the grad, you know, working a day or two a week. Um, And, you know, they'll send that out to journalists. But when you have a dedicated media team working for a 500-person strong practice, the use case is slightly different. And I think, as I said before, it goes back to having a media-ready res- repository because um, there are a lot more sort of inbound media requests at a large practice. So it's just impossible to be able to go to a director and ask for sign-off on every kit every time because, yeah, you know, just... you're getting maybe 10 inquiries a day. We just have to have everything ready to go. Um, but I would also say that 
in some way, small practices use it as a media-ready repository also because as you start to tell your story and as you start to get published online and in print, um, other publications come to you and go, oh, I would love to feature this story. You know, you've got a beautiful window seat here looking over, you know, these rolling hills. Can we, you know, take a different angle and talk about the interiors? So having everything ready to go, I feel, um, it really does just work for everyone no matter your practice size. Um, the main criteria is having work that can be published. So we don't, we can't work with every architect. We have to work with architects who, A, they have good photography, but they have good projects as well, which match the publications which we work with. So we, sometimes we talk about every project probably has a home somewhere, but we need to match the projects to what the journalists that we work with are looking for. And what, what, what's that kind of criteria? What kind of criteria do you have in terms of, or advice do you have for architects in terms of having good quality photography and what are the mistakes that architects make with um, images? So photography is a big topic in itself. I guess the starting point is um, if you've got a project which has an interesting story it, or if it stands out or there's something new there that's worth talking about, that's an interesting project. A boring project is something like a office which is all just white plasterboard. There's no story there. Well, I say that. There could always be a story there. That's something that we've both learnt. Mm. Um, we, when we started this, we obviously had our biases um, towards projects which we thought were awesome. And we would just say, that's, that's going to get published. That's not going to get published. And we've learnt over time that sometimes journalists are looking for a different type of story, mm. like the project about the, uh, with context. That was a huge learning curve for us. Yeah, yeah. There was one. There was this project in Sydney that was. Um, it's actually a fantastic story, <laughs> but it's um, a, a concrete uh, house. It's, it was designed for people who have a concrete company, so they basically built the whole thing out of concrete. Um, and a, a lot of the time, it'll um, when people do photography, when architects do photography, they want to cut out the ugly buildings on either side. But with this one, if you'd have cut out the buildings on the other side, it would have been a big concrete box and it wouldn't really have had a lot of context. Um, and what they did with this project is they pulled out and there are these two old sort of 1960s mm. red brick buildings really common in um, some parts of Sydney. Uh, you pulled back and all of a sudden this contrast makes the story and that was really, that was really fascinating for us to watch. Yeah, because what happens is we see all the journalists jumping in and downloading that project. So we go, what makes that project different? Mm. And that was our conclusion with that one. Um, but overall, I think with the photography is you need to get professional photography or you need to be really good at it. Professional but, architectural photography. Sorry, yeah. yeah, that's really important. If you get somebody who does weddings, that's not the same. Uh, I've, a, I've, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> I've made that mistake. <laughs> it's just there's a specific style which um, – so what you're trying to do with your photography is you're trying to create content that publications want to use. Mm -hmm. So when I first started, I really, really loved black and white photography. I didn't shoot color until maybe two or three years later until I wanted to actually get some work because I just really liked it. And so I had this idea that maybe I could change the world and just do black and white architectural photography. Nobody wants that. It's just that it can't be published anywhere. You know, there may be a couple of magazines. But what you really try to do instead is you're trying to figure out what people want to use and then creating the content that they, they need. So getting a professional architectural photographer means that you tick the boxes and so they're going to do a decent job at least and get you to that minimum level required to get published and then after that you're looking for people who can tell stories through photos so architectural photographers don't create artworks in the sense of putting something up on the side of a wall what they do is they create series of images which take you on a journey through a building and that's something that's slightly different to what wedding photographers do or you know other genres so people who do that really well and can capture the, not just the details of a building, but potentially how it feels, um, that's important. And I mean, we've got lots of tips. We talk about this all the time about people and shots. Like there's, there was a tradition where architects never put people in shots. People and shots are really important. It gives you scale of a building. It gives you a sense of activity. Like if you try and photograph a restaurant without people, it looks like a ghost town. It, sure, there's all these architectural features, but what I want to see is I want to see that that space works. I want to see that people are enjoying themselves and 
So there's a whole series of little things like that, which I think are valuable and good photographers will know that. Right. Yeah. And I, I think I think our biggest tip to architects is value your photography. So getting a proper architectural photographer, um, paying them a good rate um, is is really sensible. Um, you're actually, it's some of the only marketing that you do as an architect. And the great thing about architectural publishing and architects might not always think about this, but it's generally apart from the production of the content, um, it's free to do. You know, magazines aren't charging you to be featured in their publication. They make their money from selling ad- advertisements to um, product suppliers and mm. things like that. So I'd say really value your photography if, um, you know, there's, there's always going to be a limit to how much you should pay for <laughs> photography. Mm. But generally, most architects we speak to, I'd say 99% of them are probably paying not enough for their photography. They should be paying their photographers more. Um, and again, that comes down to professional architectural photographers who are doing great work um so that's really the trick is finding those ones an easy way to do that is to look on all the publications look at the projects you love the ones that look like yours that you'd like to capture a similar essence find out who the photographer is they'll be credited there um you can start to reach out to them there's also a whole heap of new photographers coming through if you can find someone who's generationally the same as you so finding someone who's just starting if you're just starting out your architecture practice find a photographer who's just starting out their photography practice um and you can sort of grow along with them but really keep in mind that it's it's one of the most important investments that you'll make as a, as an architecture practice. And and does this the same go for video and video other forms of media? Um it, the general principle is the same. The difference is that photography has such a a wide area to be used. Like there's a there's a whole engine there of all these publications who want to use those images. Video is this thing we talk about a lot. We think there's a tipping point. It's going to be big and it's starting to get there. The issue is that traditionally it's been expensive to make yeah. and there hasn't been many places for it to exist. So you have a chicken and the egg um, scenario. And when I mean it doesn't have many places to exist, I mean there's not many publications who focus on video and what you're after is the audience behind that. So you can create your own video and put it on your website. That's great. But if there's nobody going to your website, what's the point? But what we're seeing is now with things like drones coming into play, the cost of video is really dropping and people are starting to experiment with it. And I think over the next couple of years, we'll see far more content coming up. And as soon as that kicks into people wanting or journalists wanting more video content, that'll start to ramp up and we'll see far more of it. And do you give, do you give guidance then as well for people producing their own content for their own media platforms, like their own social media accounts or is it? We talk to anybody about anything pretty much. Um, (laughs) We have a whole series of people who, you know, I guess we call them friends now, who we've been talking to for years. They ask lots of questions, um, especially coming out of architectural photography because I used to have an architectural photography blog. So I'd answer a lot of questions, always an open book, trying to say this is how I learnt what I did. There wasn't much information out there. So I've always had this principle that if somebody asks me a question, I want to share that with them. And I think it's generally good for the industry. The more content we create, the more stories we tell, then the more of the general public who get involved and you end up with a cycle which is positive. Um, but yeah, we do have people asking us all the time, like, what do you think we should do? Yeah, we're, we're very focused on one thing, which is getting architecture published. So that that is our realm um, yeah. and making those connections wherever we can. Um, so I think when you're looking at larger strategies around how you communicate your practice through your different channels, how your website works, like we generally just say, hey, here's someone really great who can help you with that rather mm-hmm. than doing it ourselves. If someone asks us a question, you know, just like, should I put this on my Instagram account? We'll definitely give a response. <laughs> but really, the, it's sort of like, I suppose Balbert is a gateway drug to really fully considering um, your, <laughs> your, your approach to marketing. So uh, generally, marketing has been like a four-letter word for architects for such a long time. Um, and now when we walk into a room and talk about marketing, everyone's just like, yeah, that's fine. We're okay with that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that comes from being a, a capital P profession. You know, um, th- we're architects, so we, we shouldn't have to do these marketing, you know, these business tricks. But marketing isn't a business trick. It's essentially just telling your story and communicating that well to the audience that you want to reach so yeah I, I think we can definitely provide little tips here and there but if you're thinking um, really seriously about your strategy how you're actually marketing your business we can definitely connect you up with some amazing people out there because we're meeting with these people every day in mm. cities all over the world these awesome people often sort of ex-editors or even ex-architects um, who go out and 
understand the the real specifics of mm. marketing um, and we can just join those dots and you'll find that person and you know they're essentially bowbird verified because we like them and they buy yeah. into our philosophy as well so mm. and so how have you developed your network of of journalists and of the, the and publications we well it works in a couple of ways so on the platform itself uh, any user can suggest a publication so if an architect finds a publication in their hometown, let's say it's quite small, let's say it's a uh, print magazine on restaurants and it's only distributed you know, locally, we would never know about that, but they do. So they suggest it and then we go do the research about it to see if it publishes good architectural content. So we verify it. Then we reach out to the journalist behind it and say, hey, look, we've got all these projects that you can use as content. Uh, would you be interested in being on the platform? And once we've done that, um, if we can get to that city, we go and meet with them and we nurture those relationships. So we kind of do what all of these individual architects have been doing themselves, but we just do it at a much larger scale. Yeah, for the, for the journalists, we are like their research team. So, you know, large publications used to have researchers who just went out there and found uh, content and commissioned stories. Um, as publishing has become less lucrative, a lot of those editors and journalists have gone, research teams, definitely some of the first to be cut. Mm -hmm. So we can now provide this service to lots of different publications and we can actually start to provide better matches for those publications as well. So um, we'll have editors who come to us and say, hey, we're looking for amazing wardrobes. Um, you can actually search through Valverde. They can search for wardrobes, but we can also go out to our audience and say, hey, have you done any really interesting wardrobes lately? Um, send them in and submit them to these publications. So those journalists, the conversation is actually really simple for us. We just go and say, are you looking for content? The answer is invariably <laughs> yes. Um, and we just facilitate that for them. And how and are architects able to network communicate with each other via the platform as well no not exactly so um one of the uh, original ideas for us is that we wanted the communication to be always around a project and it's around a project which is completed and the idea there is to cut down the noise of the back and forth that journalists get right so if you imagine you're you're running a global website you've got thousands of people just emailing you you've got no idea who they are so our job is to basically be a filter of sorts to say when you're ready and your content is um, you know, completed, that's when you go talk to the journalist because then the journalist can publish almost instantly if they want to publish. And we're trying to get, but at the same time, you actually do talk to that actual person. So once you're ready, then you start up a relationship and you start chatting back and forth with them. And in time, yes, when you've got your next project, you can go chat to them again. So it's just a slight difference. It's not an open network like you would have in LinkedIn or something like that. Yeah, and so you and so you wouldn't you wouldn't encourage architects to try and get projects which are uncompleted published. Say that they've just got say they've reached a marker like planning permission. We have um, people trying all sorts of things. So large firms have tested it with um, what do they call it? Turning of the sod. You know, there's a photo of some politicians with a shovel, the most boring Breaking photo ground. in the world. Yeah, yeah. Gold shovel. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, <laughs> some, some local newspapers will cover it. But if you look at the architectural river of content, mm -hmm. which is all these beautiful projects, um, the stories behind them, that turning of the sod doesn't really fit very well in that. Um, yeah, the, the, the exception to um, only built work would be uh, unbuilt work that, is conceptual so highly conceptual work can often find a place um and things of major civic significance mm -hmm. um generally those ones pick up news stories and for and they're usually large architects and they're not always going to be favorable uh, mm -hmm. often large um expensive buildings in the public realm uh, will get a lot of flack from news publications so really it's just it's it's different when you're talking about unbuilt work in saying that, we've had people who've done things like there was someone, um, a university course in Melbourne had done these little um, brown card models of scenes from Harry Potter um, and they put that onto Melbourne and went out everywhere. So to say it's only completed mm. work, it's like there's, there's other things on the periphery that work really well. I mean, if, the, if it's a great idea and it's newsworthy, the journalists will pick up and on it. And it's kind of there for, to be tested as well. Mm. As a, Absolutely. We love it when people I try really, to push the limits. We spoke to a practice recently here in the UK who um, just out of interest, they wanted to test their own media capacity. So they um, designed a conceptual bathroom and it was based on the old avocado bathrooms. And they sent it out to a few journalists and it got picked up 
everywhere and started to filter down through sort of smaller publications as this completed project. The renders were fantastic. Um, But they started um, really this kind of online almost sort of trend flow in media of going back to, ooh, is the avocado bathroom coming back? What's on for 2018? (laughs) So it was really interesting to see that a conceptual project that may be just done for fun can actually have this really great drop of um, media. Yeah, because it's it's quite an interesting one as well because obviously the nature of an architectural uh, projects take a long time. Mm. What do you do if you haven't got any new projects? You want to get published. You want to be you want to be out there. What kind of content can you be producing to feed that marketing cycle? Well, I think that using your own channels is really important there. So you use Bowerbird to go out to the external press and then your own social media channels are really vital to sharing your story. So, you know, when you do break ground or when you do get planning permission, that's such a huge win because so much effort goes into those things that you should celebrate those wins, um, you know, both on your own LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram accounts. Um, In saying that, I think that there's so much power in social media because, it's a faster turnaround of media viewing, particularly Instagram stories. You can share really informal pieces of content or little videos, you know, on site that start to bring the public in to the journey with you. So when you do have that finished product and that ends up on, you know, Arc Daily or Dezine or, you know, the national press on us in the Sunday Lifestyle um, magazine, they feel like they've been on that journey with you. Yeah, and there's always there's, you've always be, built the relationship and the audience Absolutely. with the project mm. through, yeah. the, through the beginning. Another really interesting thing, just talking about, um, you know, maybe practices who have quite a solid body of work in the past but haven't got anything completing in the next 12 months. We often talk to people like that. Um, if you've got a back catalogue of work and it's work that you'd like to be doing more of, you can actually go and shout out about that again. Mm. When we first started this, we we kind of assumed that it would be, you know, projects that are finished within the last 12 months that are going to be picked up by the media. And in reality, you know, we've talked to some of the biggest blog editors in the world and they're like, we don't care when it was completed. It just the photography has to stand up and the architecture has to stand up and it has to be new to our audience. And that's it. So I think a lot of um, architects will invest a heap of money in getting that photography together, even getting the content together. Um, They'll put it up on their website. They'll maybe get published in one or two places and then they think, tick, done. That's not your marketing done. And even if something was completed five, even we've had projects that are 15 years old. Yeah, 10, 15 years. That Hmm. get picked up again push it out there again there's a whole heap of media out there that didn't Mm. exist five years ago Mm. um so you can definitely get a lot more potential from those older projects and so even if you've got a that lull in your completed work just go back push that content out again see what else you can pick up that's you know you've you've invested a lot in that you should definitely try and get more and i I guess as well there's there's really fascinating stories to be told about revisiting projects Mm. even like getting a project photographed again 10 years later, that's that's, I think all, that, that's already a fascinating story. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we would go back and look at stadiums um, and revisit them and see how they'd settled into the city um, and maybe get a photographer to go and do a dusk shoot and that's a whole new story in itself on that particular project. But I think for smaller practices as well, revisiting your um, clients and that project is a really powerful story because the clients have had time to settle into their home or their their space and they start to find moments that they really enjoy. Maybe it's standing at the kitchen sink and looking out the window at the kids playing in the backyard or, you know, maybe it's the feeling of the handrail going up the stairs. These are things that you might not have picked up on when you first completed the project, but they've grown into. So, and I think there's a lot of power in that because small practices can go back to their client and say, hi, me again, (laughs) you know, how are you going? How are you finding it? And it's also a really good, um, it's a really good way to sort of test what did and didn't work, you know, revisiting that project and going, okay, well, you know, maybe this kind of, you know, glazing is not appropriate for our next sort of project. Yeah, I think video, the talking head videos of people, like your clients, potentially the consultants as well, that's the story which rarely gets told, mm. especially with the clients because it's so emotionally based that it's powerful. So if you ask an architect about a project, they again, they will give you this massive description about anything except for the project. If you ask a client, they give you really simple statements like, I just love it or I, I didn't expect this at all. And that is heartwarming, uh, those little snippets. And they get used in stories. Like I don't know if you've noticed in – uh, different publications, they'll have a block of text and they'll pull out a quote. The bit they're pulling out 
tends to be whatever that client just said. Mm. Um, so that's powerful. They're relatively easy to make. Uh, and so if architects are looking for more content, even if the project is not that amazing, they may have a client who loves whatever was created for them. And it's the emotion that you can share. Yeah. And that, that's really that's really interesting as well. That being able to pull out how you fulfilled on solving a client's problem and the sort of benefit that it's provided for them is, you know, it can be a very powerful story in itself. Yeah, I mean, so many businesses use testimonials and you don't have to be tacky like a, you know, a shoe shop or anything like that because you actually have real uh, customers who really, really love what you, you've done. You probably changed their life in a way or at least their lifestyle. It will have adapted because of that design. So asking them some questions is... I mean, that's a great way of pulling it out. Yeah, I think do, doing what a journalist would do. So, and there's sort of, you could just ask three questions of your client, but take a take your phone, record the conversation, obviously with the permission of your client. Um, but, you know, go and have a, have a coffee with them, have a catch up in the house um, and just ask them a few questions. Like, you know, what, do you, what does a, a day in your life look like in this building? Um, you know, what's your favorite? favorite thing about the building is asking a few simple questions recording that you're going to get very natural responses from the clients uh, they're not That's going to be idea. you know they're not going to be um doing the arky speak thing from the client point of view so yeah. i think you know that's a really simple technique and you could you could even do it over the phone if you're strapped for mm-hmm. time but going and, mm. and spending some time in the house would be a great way to, to we, we definitely encourage architects to do that we'd like to see more bower kits with potentially video content or questions from the actual clients the people who are living in the building because I think that's what's hard for the journalist to get access to. Because mm. if you if you imagine that you're a journalist and your point of contact is the architect, sometimes you don't have access to the the person who's actually in the house. But you you want a bigger story or a different story to what is you know published every every day. So being able to as the architect do that interview yourself, you've just sped up the entire process. Brilliant. So what's next for Bowerbird? You guys are here in the UK. Uh, this is kind of what's next right Uh, (laughs) uh, we are trying to launch all over the world so probably a year or so ago you know we obviously launched in vancouver but we had a lot of the global publications saying can you give us more content from different places because at the time we had a lot of melbourne based content which was great for melbourne architects you guys got a huge win for um (laughs) for a while there (laughs) um and so our goal is to basically build a team of what we call bowbirders uh, which is always a little bit confusing because we call our users bowerbirders too, but we're all part of the community. We're, we're all bowerbirders. <laughs> so we're Ryan's build- a bowerbirder. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so we're building up to about twenty people around the world, and so Celeste is one of those people. Mm-hmm. And Based here in London. We're currently up to nine of us. So we've got uh, Esther is over in Hungary. We've got Chris in Vancouver. We have Elliot in Argentina. We have Lucas in Brazil. Um, Victoria in Mexico City. Yeah, and we and so now we've we've got to find some more people in these different places. Like Asia is going to be a big focus for us next year. Probably a couple more people in Europe, um, Spain, France, Israel would be interesting. Um, what what kind of people are you looking for? We're looking for people who want to build a community in their area, who enjoy traveling. So. A bowerbirder's role basically is they, they're based somewhere. So London is a great place to be based because it's big, has lots of architecture. But we also want to get architecture from all the little places. I mean, one of our big goals is this idea of democratizing architectural media and allowing more architects to be involved in the storytelling process. What was happening previously is that there was only a handful of publications. There's not that many slots. And so you saw the same architects get published over and over. So for me personally, I come from a relatively small regional town. That's where I was practicing. So I kind of... So do I and so does Celeste. (laughs) (laughs) So we've all got this sort of background of coming from the small place Mm. and going, well, we want to see stories from those places as well. So a bowerbirder jumps into different cities. So every couple of months, they'll go visit a city, go meet lots and lots and lots of architects, uh, meet all the photographers, the journalists there and Basically, we have big conversations. We help them where we can, and obviously, we encourage them to upload content to Bowerbird and to share it with journalists. Yeah, I think I think the most important criteria is that they are part of the architectural community in some way, and that they understand architects. I think there's been a lot of people who've tried to launch businesses into um, architecture, and they haven't come from an architectural background or an understanding of the 
I suppose, the pressures that architects have. Um, and they, they invariably fail because they miss the, the opportunities that are there um, and that architects are generally signing up to a much bigger mission than just starting a business and being successful. They're actually wanting to shape the world. Mm. And so I think when you understand um, where architects are coming from and you can actually join them in that mission, I think it makes a huge difference. So generally, we're looking for people who get that um, and are excited by working with architects. Um, and yeah, I guess that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, you have to enjoy architects. If you're an outsider having to deal with architects on a day-to-day basis, um, there's a lot of interesting personalities there. <laughs> He's allowed <laughs> to say this. He's an architect. Yeah, <laughs> I- I'm one of them. So, um, But yeah, people who are passionate about it and people who want to explore architecture. Mm. So one of the really cool parts of the job is when you jump into a new city, like if you were just a tourist, you probably just wander around the streets, you know, go see the sites. What we do is we go behind the doors of probably 30 to 40 different practices. We see what they're working on. We see the models uh, that they're building. They tell us the stories of what's happening in their community. They link us up with friends. They say, you know, go check out this exhibition. Um, Come have drinks with us here. And so by the time you finish being in that city, you've experienced it in a way that I've never experienced it. Separate to what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Nick, Nick and Esther um, a, a couple of weeks ago ended up at a piano recital <laughs> in an architect's office in Berlin. So if that's any indication of the crazy things that happen. <laughs> Love it. Just just the random things that people invite you to. And you just go, yeah, okay, that sounds great. Well, this, this is what I, I really love about what you guys are doing is that there is, it's not like a, a sort of dry tech piece of technology which is connecting people. There's actual, like it's driven by personal one-on-one connections absolutely and, and, and there's so much particularly like in the in the in the tech world and like you know entrepreneurship there's a there's a real sort of hunger for scale and for doing things big and we kind of forget the importance of like a one-on-one cup of coffee with somebody <laughs> and it's also about um the difference between superficial networks and really strong connections mm. and that's really important within architecture because it's so slow. It's so architects, it's very hard for them just to go, hey, yeah, I've got a project, you know, I want to go get published. Unless they've got a back catalog, they're probably waiting on their next one. Like architects do this thing where it's always the next project, that's their baby. And so if you just try to run a Facebook ad, it doesn't work because they don't know who we are, they don't, don't know what our values are. And so that doesn't have the same effect. Whereas when we travel a long distance, jump into their office, they're like, are you guys crazy? Like, what are you, what are you doing here? <laughs> answer it, is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> it's certainly not a hard and fast approach that you guys have taken in building the business. Like, as you say, you had no investment. It's all been from the ground up. But I think that's what drew me as a bow better to, you know, work with you was that I could go and spend time with people, get to understand their practice, get to understand them as architects but also as community members and for me I really love joining the dots I go okay well I've just met this photographer who really wants to do more work within I don't know education and I know that this young practice is doing an early learning center let's hook them up because they're probably going to a get on really well and it's going to be a nice experience for both of them but both are going to get a really great um, working experience and um, set of photos or um, you know, like this really great outcome that can go into the media. So I really love being able to connect people. And I think that's what makes it so fun is you get to actually go behind the scenes and get to know people on a very personal level. You know, I don't think I would be having such a good time in London if I was doing another role because mm. over the last three months that I've been here, I've probably met, I don't know, a hundred new people who have said, you know, come to this exhibition, you know, do this talk, come and meet my friends for a drink. And it's really made me feel as though I'm welcome here, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're, not, a, we're not a sales team. We're not even mm. really a, a tech. We don't have tech background. Mm. We sort of come, come from the yeah. community that we're now um, serving and working with. So, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's what we're passionate about and that's why we like doing it. I think if you hated talking about the built environment and architecture you would <laughs> hate this job we love it to the point where we we book a one-hour meeting with an architect and it runs for three hours and <laughs> we end up you know at a, at a brewery that they've designed <laughs> having beers in Vancouver um so I th- yeah I think it's um it's very much come out of who we are and what felt right for us and 
the great thing is because we we aren't a funded startup we have been allowed to do that we've allowed mm. ourselves to do that there's no one breathing down our neck going no you can't you know you've got to make your meetings an hour long um so I, yeah it's it's really it's just enjoyable really yeah. yeah i think in a funded company you'd have to be chasing that scale out a very you know in a different way and I, I remember ben and i were going so you mean we can travel we can just sort of jump into these different cities yeah that sounds like a great idea let's go do that yeah and th- that sort of grew and I mean, for me, that's still scaling. It's just scaling in a different way. And it's not about um, scaling by single numbers. It's scaling about those really committed architects who are going to stick around and support us for a long time. Mm. Like that's part of building a strong community, getting that base there. Yeah. And obviously it's it's a kind of, you know, there's only so many architects as well. And it's like developing the, the long-term relationship is going to be the one that, benefits both parties absolutely yeah because if we were to fail then all of this goes away Um, and vice versa if we don't support the architects they'll leave so we need to make sure that we're respectful of that community and that we embrace it fantastic thank you guys so much i've really enjoyed speaking to you thanks for having us great thank you so that is a wrap thank you for listening The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.